Okay, so welcome to this afternoon's colloquium. Uh, we're lucky to have Edward Fezzer with us uh, this afternoon. He hails from California, received his PhD in philosophy from uh, UCSB, among other degrees. He's currently teaching at Pasadena City College. He's a prolific author of articles, reviews, uh, blog posts, and about a dozen books or so. I've lost count. How many books have you written? It's 11 either authored or co-authored or two, okay, two 11. cases edited. So, so in physics, that's about a dozen. That's an order of magnitude <laughs> estimate was correct. Um, he has a particular interest. Well, he has a wide range of interests in philosophy, a particular interest in the philosophy of science, which he'll talk to us about today. Please help me welcome Professor Edward Fezzer. Thank you so much for the I introduction. And I, and I really uh, just want to say thank you to Fermilab for having me here and for all the hospitality that you've shown a philosopher in this, this uh, temple of experimental physics, invited philosopher. The only thing missing is the armchair from which I usually speak, so, uh, but this, this will do. I trust everyone's got a copy of the handout. Um, I've discovered that apparently giving handouts during a talk is a philosopher's thing, not an academic thing generally, so f forgive me for this. Um, but if you've got that ahead of you, I, it provides, it's supposed to provide kind of a road map to some of the things we'll be talking about. And, it, and there's a lot more technical jargon on the handout that is act, than is actually in the talk. In fact, that's why it's on the handout. I, I refer to a couple of technical terms here that I'll only be briefly referring to, I think, in the course of the talk. So um, maybe that gives a, more, uh, gives a more painful impression of the content of the talk than, than I think you'll actually find. So let me just get into my, um, my paper, which is on this question, what is a law of nature? And the notion of a physical law is perhaps the central concept of modern science. In their book, The Grand Design, Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladeno characterized the history of science as, quote, the long process of replacing the notion of the reign of gods with the concept of a universe that is governed by laws of nature, unquote. And they go on to quote Alexander Pope's famous couplet, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. The idea is that it, it is Newton's discovery of physical law that made nature at last intelligible, and that Newton's successors have increased this intelligibility insofar as they've improved upon Newton's laws and discovered further ones. Hawking and Mladeno are, of course, expressing a view that is very common among scientists and admirers of science. But what exactly is a law of nature? Hawking and Mladeno characterize a law as, quote, a rule that is based upon an observed regularity and provides predictions that go beyond the immediate situations upon which it is based, unquote. Here, too, their position is no doubt a common one, but their answer is not terribly informative because the terms law and rule are often used synonymously. Suppose you asked a political philosopher what liberty is, and he told you that liberty is freedom. You'd probably respond, well, yes, I already know that much because the terms are more or less interchangeable. I wasn't asking you for a synonym, though. I want to know the nature of the thing that the words liberty and freedom both refer to. Now, in the same way, since the words law and rule are often used interchangeably, it isn't very helpful to say that a physical law is a kind of rule. What we need to know is the nature of the laws or rules that are said to govern the physical world. To be sure, Hawking and Mladeno do say more than merely that a law of nature is a kind of rule. Again, they tell us that laws are inferred from observed regularities and that we can derive predictions from them. They also tell us that, quote, in modern science, laws of nature are usually phrased in mathematics and that they must have been observed to hold without exception, at least under a stipulated set of conditions, unquote. And they tell us that physical laws are consistent principles in contrast with the arbitrary and inscrutable whims of the gods in terms of which pre-scientific cultures explained natural phenomena. But while somewhat informative, even these remarks still don't really answer our question. Suppose you asked a geometer what a triangle is, and he told you that in Euclidean geometry, the angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees, that you could discover various features of triangles by constructing proofs, and so on. All of that is true, but it doesn't really answer your question. What the geometer would be telling you about is a certain property of triangles and a method for coming to know things about them. But what you asked about was the nature of the thing that has these properties and the nature of the thing that can be known in this way. What you need is what is captured in a definition like, quote, a triangle is a closed plane figure with three straight sides, unquote. That tells you what a triangle is, and not merely certain properties of triangles or facts about them. Similarly, to say that physical laws make natural phenomena intelligible, or that they are stated in mathematical terms, 
or that we infer them from observed regularities, or that we can derive predictions from them only tells us about certain properties of laws or of facts about them. It does not tell us what a physical law is. It does not tell us the nature of the thing of which these various claims are true. Surprisingly, other scientists who comment on the subject are often not much more informative than Hawking and Laudanow. Even Richard Feynman's book on the subject, The Character of Physical Law, for the most part focuses on describing various specific examples of laws of nature and some, gen uh, some general features that they share rather than offering a systematic account of what a law of nature is. However, philosophers of science have explored this issue in considerable depth, and what I want to do in this talk is to examine the five main concepts, five main accounts of what a law of nature is that have been proposed over the centuries. They are as follows, just to sum them up very briefly and then expand upon them in the, in the rest of the talk. First, there's what's called the theological account of laws according to which a law of nature is a kind of divine command. Second, there is the regularity theory of laws, which, as the name implies, holds that a law is essentially nothing more than a regularity or pattern found in nature. Third, there is the platonic view that a law is a relationship of necessary connection between the properties of things understood as abstract entities, that is to say, as something like platonic forms. Fourth, there is the instrumentalist view that laws of nature don't really exist, but are merely convenient fictions useful for making predictions. And fifth and finally, there is the Aristotelian view that a law describes the causal powers that a material thing or system will tend to manifest given its nature or essence. What do I mean by that? I'm going to say more about it later on, but that's just kind of the, the, the one-line description. So let me break the suspense by telling you that what, what I will be arguing is that the first four views are all wrong. In my view, they are anyway. That the last Aristotelian account of physical laws is the correct one. Let me also tell you up front one of the reasons why this matters, and it's a reason that I suspect you will find surprising. In recent years, a number of prominent scientists, including Hawking and Laudano themselves, Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, Peter Atkins, and Jerry Coyne, have been vigorously promoting scientism, the view that science is not only a genuine source of knowledge, which nobody really denies, but the only genuine source of knowledge. They've also been using scientism as a cudgel with which to beat theology and accordingly as an argument for what has come to be called the new atheism. And they have, into the bargain, sometimes pitted modern science in its method of searching for laws of nature precisely against the Aristotelian tradition and philosophy, as Hawking and Mladeno do in the potted history of science they provide at the beginning of their book. Obviously, given what I've already said, I'm going to argue against this supposition that there is an incompatibility between modern science and Aristotelian philosophy. Notice I said Aristotelian philosophy. I didn't say Aristotelian physics. That's, that's another issue. Um, another implication of my discussion is going to be that scientism is false, the view that science alone gives us knowledge. Science certainly gives us knowledge, but it's not the only genuine source of knowledge. And there are serious questions about reality that need to be answered, but which the methods of science cannot answer. And one of those questions is about the nature of laws of nature. Now, since I have in various writings of mine, for those of you who might be familiar with them, been very critical of the new atheist thinkers that I just mentioned, you might expect that I'm going to be deploying these claims in support of some sort of theological conclusion. Here is where you're likely to find the upshot of my discussion surprising, indeed ironic. For in fact, while I'm no atheist, what I'm going to argue is that the Aristotelian account of physical law is the only view on which we can both make sense of how physical laws have the explanatory power that science says they have, and do so without directly bringing God into the picture. In fact, the Aristotelian view provides something like neutral ground between atheism and theism, at least where the subject of laws of nature is concerned. Maybe not on other topics, but on, on that subject. And in fact, the alternatives to the Aristotelian view are, in a sense, if anything, more favorable to theology, or at least a certain kind of theology, than the Aristotelian view is. This may all sound strange, but I think it will sound less so once we work through the various theories about the nature of physical law that I referred to earlier. So let's get to that. And I start the Roman 2 there on the handout with the theological account of laws of nature. So we'll start with that account of what a law of nature is because this was, as a matter of historical fact, modern science's original understanding of what a law of nature is. Descartes and Newton, for example, famously regarded laws of nature as divine commands. The idea was that matter has no inherent tendency to behave in any particular manner. It is simply inert, passive stuff that by itself could be ordered this way or that, depending on what laws are imposed on it from outside. The laws discovered, according to this view, laws discovered by natural science reflect the specific kind of order that God has willed to impose on matter. 
The laws are universal and inexorable because they reflect the universal and inexorable will of God. God has decreed that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion in a uniform speed in the same direction unless acted upon by an outside force. God's decreed that planets will move in elliptical orbits. God's decreed that radium will have a half-life of 1,600 years, and so on. Material phenomena are like an army which follows to a T the directives of its divine commander-in-chief. Uh, so say Newton and Descartes, anyway. The other accounts of what a law of nature is that we're going to examine later on in the talk can all be seen as essentially reactions to this original theological conception, which at least implicitly and partially, uh, which at least implicitly, implicitly and partially define themselves in opposition to it. Indeed, the physicist Paul Davies has argued that contemporary thinking about laws of nature has never really entirely escaped this theological baggage that was originally associated with the concept. In a recent essay, Davies, uh, Davies writes the following, quote, the orthodox view of the nature of the laws of physics contains a long list of tacitly assumed properties. The laws are regarded, for example, as immutable, eternal, infinitely precise mathematical relationships that transcend the physical universe and were imprinted on it at the moment of its birth from outside like a maker's mark and have re remained unchanging ever since. In addition, it is assumed that the physical world is affected by the laws, but the laws are completely impervious to what happens in the universe. It is not hard to discover where this picture of physical laws come from. It is inherited directly from monotheism, which asserts that a rational being designed the universe according to a set of perfect laws. And the asymmetry between immutable laws and contingent states mirrors the asymmetry between God and nature. The universe depends utterly on God for its existence, whereas God's existence does not depend on the universe. A little bit more here from Davis. Davies. Clearly, then, the orthodox concept of laws of physics derives directly from theology. It is remarkable that this view has remained largely unchallenged after 300 years of secular science. Indeed, the theological model of the laws of physics is so ingrained in scientific thinking that it is taken for granted. The hidden assumptions behind the concept of physical laws and their theological provenance are simply ignored by almost all except historians of science and theologians." Unquote. Okay, that was all a long quote from Paul Davies. The eminent philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, has made similar observations. In fact, Cartwright goes so far as to say that the notion of a law of nature cannot possibly be made sense of apart from God. In her view, you can have atheism or laws of nature, but not both. Now, Cartwright does not use this thesis as an argument against atheism, by the way, because she does not herself believe that there really are any laws of nature. So she would throw both those things out together, I take it. Now, in my opinion, Cartwright goes a bit too far. I think that we can make sense of the notion of laws of nature without appealing to God. But it is true that the notion has theological origins, and as we will see, Davies and Cartwright are correct that even much purportedly secular thinking about the nature of physical law is more beholden to these theological origins than is usually realized. All the same, in my opinion, the theological conception of physical law ought to be rejected because it simply gets nature wrong and into the bargain, it's bad theology. To see how, consider an analogy. During a game of checkers, the game pieces on the board will move around in regular patterns. Perhaps, even if you'd never heard of the game before, you could work out some of its rules by observing these patterns. But it would, of course, be a mistake to think that in discovering them, you were discovering something about the game pieces themselves, or about how they tend to behave. For in fact, the game pieces don't do anything. Left to themselves, they would just sit there. It's the players of the game who are doing everything, and in studying the patterns you see on the board, you are really only indirectly studying them. In particular, you are figuring out what the players are doing and what is going on in their minds. Now, the theological conception of physical law, the idea that a physical law is just a divine command, essentially makes of the natural world a kind of checkers board and God the sole player. And it makes of natural science a kind of theology. In searching out the laws of nature, the scientist on this view is not really studying what nature is doing, but rather is studying what God is doing. For nature itself isn't really doing anything on this view, any more than, che uh, than checkers game pieces are doing anything. Only God is really doing anything, if you buy Newton and Descartes' view of what laws are. Now this amounts to a view about causality known in the history of philosophy and theology as occasionalism. Technical term alert, but I'll make it as painless as I can. According to occasionalism, it isn't really the cue ball that knocks the eight ball into the corner pocket. It is God who knocks the eight ball into the corner pocket on the occasion when the cue ball makes contact with it, hence the name. It isn't really the sun that causes the ice in your lemonade to melt. It is God who causes it to melt on the occasion when the sun is out. And so on for all other apparent causal connections in nature. None of them is real. 
Only God ever really does anything, and the physical world is utterly inert. Now, one problem with a view of uh, that, that, that laws of nature are divine commands, I would say, is that it leads to occasionalism, it leads to this view about cause and effect, namely that there really isn't any such thing in the world. Um, in particular, one problem with this, this view is that if it were true, natural science wouldn't really be possible. As we've seen, Hawking and Mladeno characterize science as in the business of discovering principles in nature that are consistent and exceptionless, as contrasted with the inscrutable or arbitrary whims of the gods. And I think they're right about that. But if a physical law were nothing more than a kind of divine command, then science couldn't discover such principles in nature. That is not because God is arbitrary, but because nature would be arbitrary. Go back to the checkers analogy. There's nothing in the nature of a checkers game piece itself that can tell you how it will behave. If the players want to use the pieces to play a game of checkers, then the pieces will move around in patterns typical of a checkers game. But they could instead decide to use them in some other way, for example, as money, or to make costume jewelry, or some other use. We can even imagine that they could have perfectly reasonable and non-arbitrary grounds for doing so. But the behavior of the checkers game pieces would no longer fit some exceptionless or consistent pattern. Similarly, if the theological account of laws of nature were correct, then there would be no reason to expect exceptionless or consistent patterns in nature. God could make nature operate according to one set of laws today and a different set tomorrow. For example, whereas the sun will tend to melt the ice in your lemonade today, tomorrow it might behave according to different laws in such a way that it will freeze the lemonade or turn it into gasoline. We can even imagine that God would have perfectly rational and non-arbitrary grounds to make this happen. The point, though, is that nature itself would seem arbitrary and unpredictable. And yet that's not, in fact, how nature behaves, which tells against the theological view of laws. In short, the theological account of laws of nature, when worked out consistently, really seems to deny that there is any such thing as law. There's just the inscrutable will of God. And one problem with this view is, again, that this is simply not borne out by actual experience. For physical science has, in fact, discovered law-like patterns in nature. Hence, even if God exists, and I think he does, but put that aside for present purposes, a law of nature cannot be understood as a kind of divine command. Some other account of physical laws must be correct. Okay, so that's the theological account. Now I want to move on to the, to the next one. This is uh, Roman 3 there on the handout, the regularity theory of laws. So let's turn to that, regularity theory of laws of nature. To state this view in its simplest form, a law of nature is simply a regular pattern that we happen to find in nature. It's not that God or anything else causes this regularity to exist in nature. It's just there in nature, and that's that. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion at a uniform speed in the same direction less at and less acted upon. Planets have elliptical orbits. Radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, and so on. That's just how the world is. In the philosophy of science, this view is often traced back to David Hume, and it seems to be the view taken by at least many contemporary scientists. For example, Feynman seems to be committed to something like it when he gives physical laws the following characterization in his book, The Character of Physical Law. Quote, there is a rhythm and a pattern between the phenomena of nature which is not apparent to the eye, but only to the eye of analysis. And it is these rhythms and patterns which we call physical laws, unquote. Okay, that's Richard Feynman. The basic idea of the regularity theory is very simple, and many scientists seem to think it obvious and unproblematic. But philosophers of science who defend it have had to qualify it significantly because on closer inspection, the regularity theory is subject to several serious, and indeed, in my opinion, insuperable objections. The first problem is that a pattern's being regular is not, in fact, sufficient. It's not itself, by eno it's not itself enough to make it a law of nature take a stock example, consider the following two regularities. One, every lump of gold is smaller than one cubic mile in size. And two, every lump of uranium-235 is smaller than one cubic mile in size. Both of these statements are true, but there is a crucial difference between them. Though there is, in fact, no lump of gold as large as a cubic mile, such a lump is at least theoretically possible. But a lump of uranium-235 that large is not theoretically possible because a chain reaction would occur before the lump could get anywhere close to that big. So though the regularity concerning uranium-235 plausibly counts as a law of nature, the regularity concerning gold does not. So there must be something more to a law of nature than merely being a regularity. Or consider an example like the following, made famous by philosopher Nelson Goodman. Suppose it were a law that all emeralds are green and also a law that all sapphires are blue. 
That's not quite correct, in fact, but for the sake of simplicity, suppose it were. Or substitute a different example, if you wish. Doesn't really matter the point. Now consider the attribute of being gru. This is a famous term introduced by Nelson Goodman. Uh, which something has if it's observed before December 31st, 2050 and is green, or observed after December 31st, 2050 and is blue. And we say it's gru if it has that feature. And consider further, you think that's weird, consider further the attribute of being an emerar, emerald and sapphire, an emerar, which something is if it's observed before December 31st, 2050 and is an emerald, or is observed after December 31st, 2050 and is a sapphire. Okay. Then it will be true, we'll have the regularity that, quote, all MRIers are GRU. That will be a true regularity. We, we follow those definitions. But it seems implausible to regard this regularity as a law of nature. Of course, you might object that attributes like being GRU or being an MRIer are silly and obviously made up rather than capturing some objective feature of nature. But that's precisely the point. Since, precisely because of its artificiality, a regularity like, quote, all MRIs are GRU does not plausibly count as a law of nature. Again, the lesson to draw from that is that there must be more to a law of nature than simply being a regularity. The actual existence of a regularity does also does not appear to be necessary for something to be a law of nature. It's neither sufficient nor necessary. This is another problem. For example, consider a law to the effect that particles of a certain kind have a 50% probability of decaying within a certain period of time, T. Let's label it T. It might seem that there is a regularity that makes this a law, namely that among any collection of particles of the type in question, a certain proportion will in fact have decayed by time t. But suppose there happen to be only one such particle. It is perfectly possible that that particle will not in fact decay by time t. In that case, we would not have a certain proportion of particles de decaying by time t, and thus we would not have any actual regularity for the law to describe. But there nevertheless would still be a physical law to the effect that any particle of that type has a 50% probability of decaying by time t. So there wouldn't be an actual regularity in nature, but it would still be a law. So a law can't be identified with a regularity, even if there's some relationship there. Consider also that there are chemical elements that do not exist in nature, but would have to be produced artificially in the lab or by nuclear explosions, if they are to exist at all. And in honor of my hosts here, I'll cite fermium as an example. As with other elements, there are physical laws that describe the properties and behavior of fermium. But suppose fermium had never, in fact, been produced. Then the laws of nature describing fermium would still be true, even though they corresponded to no actual regularities found anywhere in nature. For it would still have been true, even under those circumstances, that if fermium were to exist, then it would behave in such and such a way. Okay. So laws are neither, uh, regularities are neither sufficient nor necessary for being a, a law of nature. So there must be more to laws than that, than just being a regularity. Now, it might seem that some of these problems could be dealt with if we added what philosophers call counterfactual conditionals to our statement of a law. Here's another jargon alert, right? The counterfactual conditional. So a counterfactual conditional is a statement about what would have happened if a certain situation that did, did not, in fact, exist had existed a counterfactual situation, counter to fact. Hence, as I just indicated, even in a world without any actual fermium, we could still state laws governing fermium by stating that if fermium had existed, then it would have behaved in such and such a way. Or we could say that if we had tried to produce a lump of uranium-235 as big as a cubic mile, then it would have caused a chain reaction before it could form. Since no, counterfactual, since no such counterfactual conditional would be true, of a lump of gold the size of a cubic mile, it might seem that we could use counterfactuals to capture the fact that the regularity concerning uranium-235 is a genuine law, while the regularity concerning gold is not. Just introduce counterfactual statements into your definition, your characterization of a law, and you get around these sort of examples that I've been, that I've been giving. However, <clears throat> this will not work, because it gets the relationship between laws and counterfactual conditionals the wrong way around. Counterfactual conditionals will be true only given certain background assumptions, including assumptions about what the laws of nature happen to be. Hence, consider the counterfactual conditional statement to the effect that if a certain object had been set in motion, then it would have continued in motion at a uniform speed. This counterfactual will be true only on the assumption that Newton's first law is in fact true, and that the object in question was not being acted upon by an outside force. So we cannot analyze laws of nature in terms of counterfactual conditionals because we have to analyze counterfactual conditionals in terms of laws of nature. We would be putting the cart before the horse. 
Okay. Now, there's some further complications that I allude to here on the handout uh, to the regularity theory of laws associated with the uh, philosopher David Lewis. I'm going to skip that because it gets more technical. Um, because I want to get to what I refer to here on the handout, uh, this is point F under, under Roman 3 there, as the main problem with the idea that laws are just regularities. So there's an even deeper and more serious problem with the regularity theory of laws, however many qualifications we add to it. The problem is that if a physical law is a mere regularity, then it doesn't really explain anything. All it does is redescribe things. Suppose you say, planets always move in elliptical orbits. I wonder what explains that. Suppose I answer, Kepler's first law explains that. You then ask, oh, how interesting. What is Kepler's first law? And I respond by telling you that Kepler's first law states that planets always moved in elliptical orbits. It says a little more than that. but Now, obviously, we've gone around in a circle. I haven't really explained the regularity in question at all, but merely slapped the label law on it. If laws are mere regularities, that's all they are, nothing more to be said, then slapping a new label on a phenomenon is all that I could be doing. Again, the regularity theory tells us that a law simply describes a regular pattern that we find in nature. To say that it is a law that all A's are B's, whatever we plug in for A and B, is just a fancy way of saying that, as a matter of fact, all the A's that exist in the world happen to be B's. If I tell you that all the chairs in this room are beige, that would obviously be no explanation of the fact that the chair to my left is beige or of the fact that the chair to my right is beige. By the same token, if I say that all planets move in elliptical orbits, that does not provide an explanation of the fact that Mars moves in elliptical orbit or that Venus moves in elliptical orbit. It merely summarizes the facts to be explained rather than actually explaining them. It's useful to compare this to the theological view of laws of nature, which I already rejected. On the theological view, to say that all planets move in, move in elliptical orbits is to say that God has decreed that that is how planets are going to move. Notice that that does give us an explanation of the regularity. You might not think it is a good explanation. That's another matter. The point is that it does at least give us some answer to the question about why the regularity holds. Recall that I said that the theological view of laws entailed occasionalism, which is uh, this technical term for the view that God is the only real cause of anything that happens in the world. The reason the ice in your lemonade melts when the sun is out is, that the, uh, is not that the sun causes the ice to melt, but that God does on the occasion when the sun is present, and so on and so forth. David Hume, the father of the regularity theory of laws, is sometimes described as advocating something like occasionalism without God. You just take occasionalism, nothing in the world causes anything else, God causes everything, then you subtract God from the picture, you got the regularity theory of laws. For Hume, the sun's coming out is followed by ice melting, and that's all we can say. It isn't that the sun causes anything, and it's not that God causes anything either. There are just these patterns there in the world, and that's all that can be said. There's no causal explanation to be had and no other explanation either. And the trouble with this, of course, is that Hawking and Mladeno and other defenders of science have told us that it's only with the rise of modern science and its appeal to laws of nature that we've finally gotten genuine explanations of natural phenomena, whereas theological explanations were pseudo-explanations. If the regularity theory of laws were true, then this would turn out to be the reverse of the truth. Now, you might be tempted to say that the appeal to Kepler's laws really is a genuine explanation of the motion of the planets because Kepler's laws can be interpreted as a special case of Newton's laws. And Newton's laws make reference to concepts like force, mass, and acceleration that can illuminate why the planets move. But if the regularity theory of laws were true, this would be an illusion because Newton's laws, too, would really merely describe regularities rather than explain them, even if the description is a more general one. So go back to my example of the chairs. Suppose you ask me why the chair to my left is beige, and I answer, because all the chairs in this room are beige. Suppose you object that this doesn't really explain the color of the chair at all, and I reply, but the fact that all the chairs in the room are beige is actually a special case of the more general fact that all the furniture in the room is beige. And to point that this brings out a new concept, the concept of furniture, which illuminates the fact that all the chairs are beige. Obviously, this doesn't really illuminate anything. And by the same token, even if you can derive Kepler's laws from Newton's and then take Newton's in turn to be an approximation of Einstein's, you still will not really have explained anything if, if physical laws are mere regularities and there's nothing more to be said. All you'll be doing is describing the phenomena to be explained using more general concepts rather than actually explaining the phenomena. Okay, and this brings me to Roman IV, an excursus on laws and explanation. Um, so before moving on to the next theory of what a physical law is, I want to pause over this issue of the explanatory power um, of the laws of nature because some interesting things have recently been said about it by a couple of scientists of note. 
So consider first the views of physicist Sean Carroll, who appears to endorse the regularity theory of laws and directly addresses the objection that given such a theory, physical laws, quote, this is quoting from Carroll now, physical laws might describe what the universe does, but they don't explain the reason why it does those things, unquote. Carroll's response to this objection is essentially to bite the bullet and acknowledge that on his account, the fundamental laws of nature are simply, simply brute facts without explanation. They just are the way they are, and there's, there's no intelligibility to it. They're a brute fact, okay. Now, he rejects what is traditionally, traditionally called the principle of sufficient reason, or PSR, as philosophers like to abbreviate it, according to which for anything that exists or any event that occurs, there must be some explanation sufficient to account for it, to make it intelligible. This is a principle famously associated, associated with Leibniz. There have been many philosophers and, and scientists over the centuries who have endorsed it. Uh, but Carroll, like others in the tradition tracing back to Hume, holds that at bottom the world simply is the way it is in a way that is not intelligible or explainable. He rejects PSR. Now one problem with this that Carroll seems to me insufficiently sensitive to is that it entails a massive come down from the bold claims made about science by scientists like the ones that I referred to earlier. Hawking and Laudano, Dawkins, Krauss, Atkins, Coyne, and many others. Again, they claim that science and science alone has finally given us genuine explanations of natural phenomena in a way that they claim philosophy and theology do not. But if the regularity theory of laws is true and the principle of sufficient reason is false, then it would turn out that even science doesn't really provide explanations at all. It only seems to because we usually don't think very carefully about the implications of the regularity theory of laws and the rejection of PSR. This is actually a common problem. Many amateur philosophers who thrill to Hume's criticisms of theology and metaphysics don't realize that David Hume's skepticism, if followed through consistently, takes down everything, science no less than religion and traditional philosophy. Another problem, though, and a deeper problem, is that Carroll is simply wrong, in my view, to reject the principle of sufficient reason. For one thing, considered even just as an inference from experience, PSR is as well supported as any law of nature. We do, in fact, tend to find explanations when we look for them. And even when we don't, we tend to have reason to think there's an explanation, but just one to which, for whatever reason, such as missing evidence, we don't have access. Furthermore, the world simply doesn't behave the way we would expect it to if PSR were false. Events without any evident explanation would surely be occurring constantly, and the world simply would not have the intelligibility that makes science and everyday common sense as successful as they are. That the world is as orderly and intelligible as it is would be a miracle if the principle of sufficient reason were not true. But even that is putting it mildly, because PSR is in fact more certain than even the best supported empirical hypothesis would be, or so I would argue. For on close analysis, it turns out that any position that denies the principle of sufficient reason will ultimately be incoherent, especially if, as with Carroll, the denial is made in the name of science. One way to see this is suggested by some remarks made by philosopher Alexander Proust, who teaches at Baylor University, who was in turn developing a, po a point made by Robert Kuhns, uh, University of Texas. Denying PSR, Proust notes, entails radical skepticism about perceptual experience. For if PSR, the principle of sufficient reason, is false, then there might be no reason whatsoever for our having the perceptual experiences we have. In particular, there might be no connection at all between our perceptual experiences and the external physical objects and events that we suppose cause those experiences. Nor would we have any grounds for claiming that even such a radical disconnect between perception and external reality is improbable. We couldn't even say that much. For objective probabilities depend on the objective tendencies of things. And if the principle of sufficient reason is false, then events, including perceptual experiences, might occur in a way that has nothing to do with any objective tendencies of things. Hence, one cannot consistently deny PSR and at the same time trust the evidence of sensory perception, including the observational and experimental evidence upon which science rests. For we could have no reason to trust that evidence if PSR were false. But Proust's and Kuhn's line of argument uh, can be pushed even further than they push it. Consider that whenever we accept a claim that we take to be rationally justified in any subject matter, in mathematics, physics, you name it, as scientists do when they judge a theory to be well supported by the available evidence or consider a hypothesis to have been falsified experimentally, whenever we do this, we suppose not only that we have a reason for accepting it in the sense of a rational justification for doing so, but also that this reason is the reason why we accept it in the sense of being the cause or explanation of our accepting it. We take it that the fact that there's a rational justification is what causes us to assent to it, causes us to accept it. We suppose that it's because the rational considerations in favor of the claim are good ones 
that we are moved to assent to the claim. And we also suppose that our cognitive faculties track truth and standards of rational argumentation rather than leading us to embrace conclusions in a way that has no connection to truth or logic. But if the principle of sufficient reason were false, we could have no reason for thinking that any of this really is the case. For all we know, what moves or causes us to assent to a claim might have absolutely nothing to do with the deliverances of our cognitive faculties. And our cognitive faculties themselves might in turn have the deliverances that they do in a way that has nothing to do with truth or standards of logic. We might believe what we do for no reason whatsoever, and yet it might also falsely seem, once again, for no reason whatsoever, that we do believe what we do on good rational grounds if the principle of sufficient reason were false, if, if the world was not intelligible down to the bottom level, that is to say. Now, this would apply to any grounds or reasons we might have for doubting PSR as much as it does to any other conclusion that we might draw. Hence, to doubt or, to doubt or deny the principle of sufficient reason undercuts any grounds that we could have for doubting or denying the principle of sufficient reason. The rejection of PSR is thus self-undermining, it's self-refuting. Indeed, to reject PSR is to undermine the possibility of any rational inquiry. Okay, so that's one way in which I think Carroll's position of just biting the bullet and saying, well, maybe reality is not ultimately intelligible, it's ultimately a self-defeating or self-refuting position. Now, there's another way in which science implicitly presupposes PSR, I would argue. It might be suggested that there can be genuine explanations, including genuine scientific explanations, even if PSR were false. Carroll seems to take this view, and one finds it also taken by philosophers like J.L. Mackey and Bertrand Russell. The idea is that we can explain at least some phenomena in terms of laws of nature, and those laws in terms of more fundamental laws, and perhaps these in turn in terms of some most fundamental set of laws of nature. The most fundamental laws would, however, on this view, lack any explanation. That the world is governed by them would just be an, un an unintelligible brute fact. But this, I would argue, is also incoherent. Suppose I told you that the fact that a certain book has not fallen to the ground is explained by the fact that it's resting on a certain shelf, but that the fact that the shelf has not fallen to the ground is no explanation at all, but is an unintelligible brute fact. Have I really explained the position of the book? It's hard to see how. For the shelf has in itself no tendency to stay, to stay aloft. It is by hypothesis just a brute fact that it does so. But if it has no such tendency, it cannot impart such a tendency to the book. The explanation that the shelf provides in such a case would be completely illusory. Nor would it help to impute to the book some such tendency if the having of the tendency is itself just an unintelligible brute fact. The illusion will just have been relocated, not eliminated. But by the same token, it's no good to say, quote, the operation of law of nature C is explained by the operation of law of nature B, and the operation of B by the operation of law of nature A, but the operation of A has no explanation whatsoever and is just an unintelligible brute fact. The appearance of having explained B, a C and B would be completely illusory if A is a brute fact because if there's neither anything about A itself that can explain A's own operation, nor anything beyond A that can explain it, then A has nothing to impart to B or C that could possibly explain their operation. The notion of an explanatory regress of physical laws terminating in a brute fact is, when carefully examined, no more coherent than the notion of an effect being produced by an instrument that is not the instrument of anything. Okay, so Carroll's attempt to salvage the regularity theory of laws by denying the principle of sufficient reason will not fly. That brings me to the views of another contemporary physicist, Lee Smolin. Like Carroll, Smolin appears to conceive of laws as regularities. He seems to agree with him about that much. But unlike Carroll, Smolin also endorses the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, in his book, uh, Time Reborn, he, he endorses this and uses it as uh, a key tool in developing his own position on the nature of time. So unlike Carroll, Smolin cannot try to bite the bullet and take the fundamental laws of nature to be unintelligible brute facts. He has to find some way to make them intelligible or explicable despite being mere regularities. The way Smolin does this is in terms of evolution, and he attributes a view, a similar view to Paul Dirac, John Wheeler, and Richard Feynman. The idea is that the laws that now govern the universe may have arisen from previous different laws, and those in turn from yet other laws. Smolin proposes that a kind of cosmological natural selection guides this process. However, there are serious problems with this view. First, we need to ask if this proposed evolutionary process is itself law governed. If it's not, then it seems that this process has no explanation, but is just a brute fact. 
but that would violate PSR, which, as I've said, Smolin himself endorses. So we have to say that the evolutionary process in question is law-governed. But now we have another problem, which is that the laws that govern the evolutionary process now themselves stand in need of explanation. If we say that they have no explanation, then we not only would once again violate PSR, but we will also have rendered pointless the initial appeal to evolution. If we're going to allow that the laws that govern the evolutionary process have no explanation, then we might as well say that the laws of nature that now govern the universe, which we were proposing to explain in terms of evolution, have no explanation. But if instead we say that the laws that govern the evolutionary process do have an explanation and posit some further higher order evolutionary process to explain those laws, then it seems we're led to a vicious regress. Now, Smolin recognizes that his position faces this problem, which he labels the meta-laws dilemma, quote unquote. And he proposes a couple of possible solutions. And for sake of time, I'll just uh, talk about one of them briefly. Um, which is to posit what he calls a principle of the universality of meta-law. Okay. What does he mean by that? The idea, the idea here is that it might turn out that all the possible meta-laws that could govern the proposed evolutionary process are equivalent to one another insofar as they would generate the same results. But it's hard to see how this solves the problem. For one thing, no reason is given for believing that there is any such principle. It appears to have no motivation other than the ad hoc one of solving the meta laws problem. For another thing, the principle wouldn't solve that problem even if it were true. The most it would show is that if there is an evolutionary process governed by a meta law, then in that case, any meta law will be as good as any other. But that doesn't explain what makes it the case that there is, in fact, such a process in the first place. If you see me eating vanilla ice cream and ask me why I'm eating it, I would not be giving a complete explanation if I told you that the only ice cream available was vanilla. That would explain why I'm eating vanilla ice cream specifically, but not why I'm eating any ice cream at all in the first place. Similarly, the most that Smolin's proposed principle could explain would be why the evolutionary process is governed by such and such a meta-law specifically. What remains to be explained is why there is any evolutionary process in the first place. And if Smolin appealed to a meta-meta-law, in order to answer that question, that would simply land him in a higher order version of the same problem. Once again, we'd have a vicious infinite regress. OK, so the upshot of this long excursus on laws and explanation then is that the regularity theory simply has no way to get around the problem that if laws are just regularities and nothing more, then they don't explain anything, which, I, which as I've said, I think is the key problem with the regularity theory of laws. OK, so the regularity theory is, I would say, the main alternative traditionally to the, the theological view. There are several other ones of which I'm going to go through much more briefly. Okay. So let me briefly talk about the remaining ones. Uh, they're on the back of the handout. Uh, this is Roman 5, the Platonic view of laws. So let's turn then to this third view of laws of nature, which again I I've referred to as the Platonic view. The easiest way to explain this view is as follows. Suppose we think of the key properties referred to in a scientific theory as something like the Platonic forms, familiar from Plato's famous theory, for those of you who've read Plato's Republic. For example, suppose we think of mass, force, and acceleration as platonic forms. There is a form, or there is the former abstract pattern of having mass, the former abstract pattern of having force, and the former abstract pattern of having acceleration. All the particular physical objects that there are participate in, this forms, in these forms. Then laws of nature on this view can be thought of as necessary connections holding between these forms. For example, Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, would be understood as describing a necessary connection holding between the form of mass, the form of force, and the form of acceleration. The law is like a higher order form, a form of forms in which these forms participate. So since all physical objects participate in the platonic forms of force, mass, and acceleration, they also participate in the higher order form that we call Newton's second law. Okay, that's the platonic theory in a nutshell. Now, if we do think of the properties in question, the pro properties like force, mass, and acceleration, on the model of platonic forms or abstract entities, then we have a problem. For this platonic account doesn't really explain why the natural world behaves in accordance with physical laws. Consider that if Platonism is true, then there are forms corresponding to all sorts of things that don't, in fact, exist. For example, there is a form, a platonic form of being a unicorn and a platonic form of being a Tyrannosaurus rex, just like there is a platonic form of being a lion. The difference, of course, is that there actually are things that participate, as Plato would put it, in the form of being a lion, uh, but there's, there are no longer things that participate in the form of being a T-rex, and there never was anything that participated in the form of being a unicorn. 
Now, by the same token, not only the laws that actually govern the world, but also alternative possible physical laws that don't, in fact, govern it, all presumably exist together in the platonic realm of abstract objects, Plato's heaven, right? the realm of the forms. So what explains why the world participates in just the specific physical laws that it does rather than one of the alternative sets of laws or no laws at all, if we think of laws as platonic forms? Abstract objects, after all, are causally inert. By themselves, they don't do anything. And so if we think of laws of nature as forms or abstract objects, we still need to appeal to something in addition to the laws in order to explain why the world actually participates in these forms. Suppose we say that we can explain this in terms of higher level laws of some sort, again understood on the model of platonic forms. Trouble with this, of course, is that we would now need to explain why the world operates according to these higher order laws, which raises the same problem all over again and threatens an infinite regress. Suppose instead that we say that God causes the world to operate according to the laws, using the forms as a blueprint for creation, as Plato himself suggested in his book, The Timaeus, in his dialogue, The Timaeus, he suggests something like this model. Then we're essentially back to the theological conception of laws of nature with all of its problems. Or suppose we say that it's just an, an inexplicable regularity that the world operates according to physical laws conceived of in platonic terms, conceived of as platonic forms. In that case, we're essentially back to the regularity view of laws with its problems. So on close inspection, I would argue the platonic view isn't really any better than the alternatives that we've already looked at and rejected. Okay, that brings me briefly to a fourth view. This is Romans 6 on the handout. Uh, the instrumentalist view uh, about laws of nature. Now, instrumentalism in the philosophy of science is the approach that says that the theoretical entities posited by scientific theories do not really exist, but are merely convenient fictions useful for organizing experience and making predictions. In the present context, the idea would be that laws of nature are merely useful fictions and don't really exist, if you're an instrumentalist about laws. The debate between instrumentalism and scientific realism is a large topic, and I'm not going to attempt to address it in any depth here. Suffice it for present purposes to say that the main argument for scientific realism in general is an argument for the reality of laws of nature in particular. And that's what's called by philosophers of science the no miracles argument. The idea is that physical theories that posit unobservable entities like atoms, fermions, bosons, and all the rest are so successful in making accurate predictions and supporting technological advances that it would be a miracle if these entities did not exist. Similarly, since the laws of nature posited by modern physical science are an essential part of this story of predictive and technological success, it would be a miracle if they did not correspond to reality. Of course, if it were a literal miracle, if someone said, yeah, it's a miracle, a literal miracle, then that would entail divine action, but that would bring us back to the theological account of laws, which I've already argued against. If we leave out literal miracles, then the point is that the success of science would be a massively improbable coincidence if laws of nature were mere useful fictions. And if we leave this coincidence unexplained, then we'll be back to the problems that we saw face the regularity theory of physical law, which I also argued against. Okay, so instrumentalism, I also say, is out. That's not going to work. Okay, so that brings us finally to Roman numeral seven there on the handout, the Aristotelian view of laws of nature. Now notice that all of the views that I've been criticizing have something in common. None of them holds that there is anything in the physical world itself that explains why it has the order that it does. For the theological and platonic views about laws of nature, this is because the order that exists in the world is to be explained by reference to something outside the world, to God's commands in the one case and to platonic forms in the other case. For the regularity and instrumentalist theories of laws, this is because there is no explanation at all to be offered, either by reference to something outside the world or by reference to anything else. It's just the way things are with no explanation. Okay. Now, the central idea of the Aristotelian view is that the explanation of the order exhibited by the physical world is to be found precisely within the physical world itself, in the natures or essences of physical objects and systems. For example, Uranium-235 will reach critical mass well under a cubic mile, not because of some arbitrary divine command, not because of some platonic form that it participates in, and not as a matter of some inexplicable brute fact or regularity, but rather because the essence or nature of Uranium-235, something internal to this particular kind of uh, physical substance itself, is what's responsible. The physical laws governing Uranium-235 are, on the Aristotelian view, to be understood as descriptions of the way that something having the essence or nature of uranium-235 will tend to behave. More precisely, they describe the active and passive causal powers that follow from the essence 
or nature of uranium-235. That is to say, the ways it will tend to affect or be affected by other things in nature. Now, there's a standard objection to this sort of view, which goes back to early modern philosophy of science, philosophy and science, and it's enshrined in Moliere's famous mockery of attempts to explain how opium causes sleep by attributing to it a dormative power. Famous joke from a play by Moliere, where the doctor is asked, why does opium induce sleep? And he says, because of its dormative virtue or dormative power. Okay. Now, the claim, the, the criticism implied by Moliere's uh, uh, scene there in that play is that to appeal to the inner nature or essence of a thing or to its causal powers is merely to utter a tautology and explains nothing. Common though this objection is, however, it's not a good one and it rests on a misunderstanding of what the Aristotelian is saying. Now, note first, the appeal to the natures or powers of, th of a thing is not, in fact, a tautology. If I were to say that opium causes sleep because it brings about slumber, that would be a tautology, saying exactly the same thing in different words. That would be a tautology. But to say that opium causes sleep because of its essence or its causal powers is not a tautology. It does not merely repeat the same thing in different words, which is what a tautology does. It tells us, for example, that there is something in opium itself that brings about sleep, that it's not just the circumstances in which it's taken that cause sleep, and that it's not just an accidental feature of this or that particular sample of opium that causes sleep, but rather reflects opium as such. Now, it's true that this is not terribly informative, but it's not uninformative either. It does have some minimal content. And the Aristotelian is not claiming any more than that. He's not denying that if you want to know exactly what it is about opium that brings about sleep, you're going to have to do chemistry and not just talk vaguely about causal powers. He is saying merely that even if a complete explanation has to do much more than merely refer to the essence and causal powers of opium, it has to do at least that much. And one of, the reason that, one of the reasons it has to do so is that there's no other way to make sense of laws of nature. For if we don't think of a physical law as a description of how a physical object will behave, given the essence and causal powers internal to it, then we either have to think of, it as a, uh, think of a law as having its explanatory force by reference to something external to the world of physical objects, namely God or platonic forms, or as having no explanatory force at all, as in the regularity theory and instrumentalism. And as I've argued, none of those options can be correct. So the Aristotelian view wins by process of elimination. But there are other things to be said for it as well. As the philosopher of science Nancy Cartwright, I referred to her briefly before, has famously argued, a curious feature of the laws of nature that we know of is that they are not, in fact, universal regularities. She first put this forward in a book of hers with the, with the rather provocative title, How the Laws of Physics Lie. All right? To be more precise, to put her thesis more precisely, if interpreted as universal regularities, laws turn out not to be strictly true, whereas if they interpret in a way that makes them come out true, then they're no longer strictly universal. For example, the law of universal gravitation will not correctly describe the behavior of bodies that are charged or subject to air friction. Newton's law of inertia holds only in circumstances where no forces are acting on a body, circumstances which never, in fact, obtain. Kepler's first law tells us that planets will move in ellipses, but this is only approximately true insofar as planets are always acted upon by the gravitational pull of other bodies, and so on. Laws are true only ceteris paribus, only when certain conditions obtain, only all things being equal. In that case, though, they correctly describe the behavior of the entities that they govern only under these particular conditions and are not true of the entities universally. Now, this makes perfect sense if we think of physical objects and systems as having active and passive causal powers or capacities, because the manifestation of a power or capacity can be blocked. For example, the law of inertia on Cartwright's interpretation describes the natural capacity of any physical object to continue in uniform rectilinear motion, where the manifestation of this capacity can be blocked by interference from outside forces, such as those that result from friction or the gravitational influence of other bodies. The law describes something real insofar as physical objects really do have such a capacity, or something analogous to it when we you know, think of this instead in, in Einstein's terms, even though the law does not describe a regularity that ever actually occurs in the world, because outside forces always are, in fact, interfering and thus blocking the manifestation of this capacity. The Aristotelian view also accounts for some of the problems that face other theories of what a law of nature is. For example, we saw that a problem with the regularity theory is that it cannot explain why odd and artificial regularities, like all MRIs are GRU, are not genuine laws. The Aristotelian would say that the reason is that genuine laws reflect the causal powers and capacities 
that a physical thing will manifest given its nature or essence. But there are, for example, no physical things that have the capacity to be green before December 31st, 2050 and blue afterwards, so that there's no such feature as being grew that a law of nature might describe. Now let me end by coming back to the implications of my discussion that I alluded to at the beginning. The first implication is that there's greater continuity than meets the eye between modern science and the older Aristotelian view of the world that it's usually thought to have supplanted. Now, of course, Aristotle and his medieval successors got a lot of things wrong, in particular where empir empirical details are concerned. Again, I'm not defending Aristot Aristotelian physics, okay. But what they got right, according to the neo-Aristotelian position that I'm describing, is the broadest outlines of nature, a very, very, very general description of nature. They were correct, uh, in particular, that natural phenomena all have essences and causal powers, even if they sometimes were wrong when trying to identify exactly what those causal powers were. Now here's a second implication. As I've said, the Aristotelian view takes a law of nature to be a description of the powers and capacities that a thing will tend to manifest given its nature or essence. That entails that laws of nature are not the fundamental level of reality because they presuppose something else, namely the existence of the physical objects and systems that the laws of nature describe. This reverses the order of things that appears to be taken for granted by many scientists. The assumption seems to be that ultimate explanation will involve tracing all of physical reality down to some set of laws of nature where the laws will in some sense be what exists fundamentally or primordially. On the Aristotelian view, this gets things backwards. No matter how far down we take the laws of nature, the existence even of the most fundamental laws will itself always necessarily presuppose the existence of something else, namely the physical system that the laws describe. What this entails in turn is that scientism is false. Scientism again holds that only scientific knowledge is real knowledge. But if scientific explanation always terminates in an appeal to laws of nature, then there's always going to be something that science cannot explain, namely the existence of the fundamental laws themselves. Because those will always presuppose the existence of a system that follows the laws. But that scientism is false should also be clear from the whole discussion to this point and whether or not one agrees with the Aristotelian position. For whether one accepts the regularity theory of physical law, or the platonic theory, or some other theory, one will always be taking an essentially philosophical position rather than a scientific one. Since science presupposes the notion of laws of nature, the investigation of what a law of nature is will, whatever conclusion one reaches, always be ultimately a philosophical rather than a scientific investigation, and that entails that there's more to be known about reality than science can reveal. Finally, if the existence of laws of nature presupposes the existence of a physical reality that is described by those laws, that obviously raises the question of why that physical reality exists. Now, one could at this point bring God back into the picture. One could argue that even if laws of nature are not divine commands, but instead just des descriptions of the way that physical things will behave given their nature essence, still the fact that these physical things exist at all requires a divine cause. One could argue that way. But one could argue instead that a divine cause is not necessary. That's not a debate I'm going to get into here. Suffice it to say that on the Aristotelian view, what directly grounds the laws of nature are the essences of physical things. So that for the purposes of analyzing the character of physical law, one can bracket off the question of whether physical things themselves have a divine cause. In that sense, the Aristotelian view of laws of nature is neutral between theism and atheism. All right, with that, with that I'll cease and, uh, and desist, and I guess we've got Q&A. So. Let's thank our speaker. Well, that was so clear, I'm not sure there's any questions, but perhaps somebody has a question. Let's start with Jeff. Uh, there's an element of the Aristotelian uh, view which is very appealing in terms of essences because it uh, is so different from people who argue that uh, nature has no essence and it's all a construction of the human mind. Yeah. How do you answer those people? Well, I yes, yeah, so the question was, uh, the, the question noted that the Aristotelian position is at odds with this idea that, that physical reality and all of reality is really a social construction or a, or a mental construction, construction of the human mind, and the question was how I would respond to that. The short answer is that I would say that that sort of view when followed through consistently also tends to be self-undermining because it always appeals to a mechanism by which the mind purportedly constructs objective reality, right? But then once you describe that mechanism, you're describing something that doesn't itself depend on 
the construction, right? It pre-exists. So if the, if the mind constructs reality, and it does so according to a certain mechanism or according to certain, certain principles, then those principles or that mechanism itself is not constructed by the human mind. It's bedrock that this alleged construction of reality rests upon. And that means that there is, at the end of the day, something, namely the mind itself, which is not constructed by the mind itself. Okay. Now, you've already got then some absolute bedrock of something that's not constructed by the mind that, and therefore cannot be explained by the operations of the mind. It's gonna, if it's going to be explained, it's going to be explained by something outside it. And then we're off, I think, to a sort of step-by-step -step refutation of this view. So that's, that's sort of a refutation of the completely general claim that everything is a construct of the mind. Well, not everything can be. The mind cannot be. So if the mind cannot be and operates according to principles that it didn't cause, there must be something outside that explains it. And before you know it, we're back to bringing objective reality into the picture in addition to the mind that purportedly constructed the objective reality. So I think ultimately it's a self-refuting view when you show how you got the first step to showing that it's false across the board. Will that be on the final? That will, yeah, you got the final exam here? Okay. Hi, so I have a, a comment more than a question, but I am very interested to hear your response. So um, it seems to me that you're building up something of, straw man, of a straw man when you talk about uh, these advocates of what you're calling a uh, scientism. I don't think, uh, for example, they're really arguing that the only kind of knowledge that is real is scientific knowledge. The, the figures you mentioned, for example, all believe in uh, the value of mathematics. Yeah. And this is not using the scientific method. This is a different epistemological category a posteriori instead of a priori, and, and, and they, 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 ex they acknowledge real knowledge, the existence of real knowledge, it doesn't come from science. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. And then secondly, um, it seems like your main objection to the idea that laws are observed regularities comes from their lack of explanatory power, but the kind of explanatory power that scientists, and I think the people that you're criticizing, uh, claim that, the, that this approach has is in that they can explain lots of facts about the world with few facts pertaining to the laws of, uh, mm -hmm. laws of nature. So um, using one law like Newton's gravitational force law, we can explain why apples drop to the ground and why planets follow elliptical orbits and why any number of other things. So it, it, you might say that's not explanatory, but in fact it's very useful. And that, in my opinion, is all that science does and all, all that it claims to do. So I don't think that is a, uh, should be taken as a blow against uh, that interpretation of the meaning of physical law or, sci or scientific natural law. Okay, right. So there were a couple issues there. So let me speak to them in reverse order. As to the, the, the regularity theory of laws, I, I think the most you're going to get on the sort of account that you're describing is a reduction in the amount of brute facts that you they have to commit yourself to. But you don't get rid of bruteness altogether. You have to embr embrace them. Right, okay. Now, I mean, one problem that I have with that is that, as I said in the paper, you, you, to be consistent, you'd have to deny the principle of sufficient reason. And I think once you do that, even the regularity you do find becomes, becomes mysterious. I mean, in other words, I don't think you can, I think that having a, a bit of brute fact in nature, it's like being a little pregnant. It's, it's all or nothing. Uh, I think when you unpack the, the implications of it, you're going to find that even the regularities you think you are explaining in some, you know, you explain to some extent by tracing them down to some brute level, that that, that, that disappears. Whatever explanatory power you think you have, I think disappears. But, it's exactly but that kind of regularity okay, right. But but now you're so now you're not really talking about explanation at all. So, part, yeah, but okay, but but now right. But now you're not really talking about explanation at all. You're you're really talking about utility, pragmatic. Okay, but if. It, Okay, but, but, but suppose, so suppose we used a word that had no didn't have that ambiguity. We didn't use the word explanation. We just talked about utility or, uh, I, did you use the word practicality? Is that? Okay, right. So, so, so utility or practical uh, applicability or pragmatic value, what have you. Okay, now, there are a couple problems with that. I, I think if you take that position, you are implicitly, if not explicitly, adopting an instrumentalist view of science, where science is really just kind of a tool and it doesn't really describe objective reality at all. It's an instrument for making predictions and developing. Okay, right. 
um, yeah. which I, I think is the mainstream interpretation of sci philosophers of science in, in this particular issue. And so I, I don't think it's necessary to refute the existence of brute facts to still say that I can use, I can build up those brute facts into in complicated ways that enable me to understand things about the world that I did not understand without building up those brute facts. So I can take, I can take Maxwell's equations and the laws of force and, and, and gravitation and whatever, and take those as all brute facts and say they don't have an explanation. And I'm not saying they don't, but let's just posit that they don't. And I can use all of that information and reason to build an iPhone. Okay. If you don't think so, that that's powerful or, or explanatory, then I, I don't know what those words mean. But no, I, I'm not denying that it's powerful explanatory. What I'm denying is that you can have the, pow the explanatory power and consistently say the other things you want to say. What, what I'm are saying the other is things I, I, I want to say. So I'm, well, I'm, as, I, as I noted a few minutes ago, I think part of what you're saying points in the direction of instrumentalism, which I pointed out precisely because I didn't think you'd want to go there. And so you confirm that you don't want to go there. You, you want to hold on to some kind of realism. Uh, I, re so, I respect some instrumentalists, but I'm not happened, I don't happen to be one. Sure, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. So the, the problem, though, is that what, if, if you have committed to some kind of realism, right, then what I, what I argued is that you need, to, you need also to be committed to the principle of sufficient reason. You can't allow brute fact into the I don't the picture think I do. All. Well, like I said, if, if uh, among the problems of denying it is that if, if you deny the principle of sufficient reason, then what you're really saying is that, that the world is ultimately not intelligible. There's the appearance of intelligibility, but at bottom it's merely I'm fine with that. What's, what, why should I object to that? Because once you let that in, then the, then the areas where you, you think you're finding regularities of the sort that allow you to develop technologies and so forth themselves become utterly inexplicable. There's no reason why you would expect that an iPhone will work tomorrow because it works today, or that it, wor it will work five seconds from now. I mean, so, uh, so the, the problem of induction now. persists, I agree, um, but that, that persists no matter how it's, you... But it's not a matter of a problem. Even, even, if you, even if you somehow solve the problem of induction, which, I mean, that's a whole other issue. I don't, I don't That is exactly the problem you just pointed to, that we don't know the iPhone will work tomorrow. That's just the problem of induction. No, no, well, that, I mean, the, that's, it, that's something he's using an as an illustration of the problem of induction, but I was using it as an illustration of something else namely of the falsity of the principle of sufficient reason. So even if, you, even if you solve the problem of induction, you would have a similar problem arise if you denied the principle of sufficient reason. You would have no rational justification for believing that science really has the utility or is going to have the utility tomorrow that it has, which nobody really doubts. So what I'm saying is, is that I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. I think that the, the, the affirming the predictive and technological success of science implicitly pr uh, presupposes PSR, whether you see it or, or, or not. So I think... Just another hypothesis. This, well, what do you mean by a hypothesis? So I, I is gave... Another, is another idea about how the universe Well, it's, but it's a, it's a, if you want to call it a hypothesis, it's a hypothesis that I gave arguments for. So I argued that denying it leads you to a kind of incoherent or self-defeating position. That's an argument. That's not merely a sort of an assertion, right? It's, it's, not an, it's, not a, it's not an empirical hypothesis, it's a hypothesis, but it's one that I've given a, an argument, a philosophical argument rather than an experimental, a p bit of experimental evidence, but it's still a rational justification. Now, the, the, other, the other thing you asked about was, the, was whether I was describing a caricature of scientism rather than the actual thing. Um, I would say I was not, because I think the, the, the people you're citing, they do cite mathematics, that's true. But I don't think they're always consistent. So if you, if you look at Jerry Coyne, for example, he's an extreme example. But I mean, Coyne, you know, you read his recent book on this subject. He's back and forth. You know, he, he gives three or four or five or six different characterizations of, of his position that are not consistent with one another. Now, other uh, thinkers who are committed to scientism, I don't think, are that incoherent. But I think his position ultimately is incoherent. Sometimes he talks about science alone. Sometimes he'll include mathematics. Sometimes he'll include philosophy. But if by philosophy you mean scientism, <laughs> So there's no clear position there. But even if you want to add in mathematics, right, and say all of knowledge is either empirical science or mathematics, right, I would challenge someone who takes that view to give me an argument for that view that is itself either an argument from empirical science or mathematics. And I submit there's no such argument. So that position, too, this broadened conception of scientism, is going to have the same kind of problem as the, as the position I described. 
suits, but that if those, those if they're not answerable by those two means, they're not answerable by any other means. For example, uh, I think the people that you mentioned would acknowledge that the hard problem of consciousness is not something that can be addressed by science or by mathematics. However, they would just say it's not answerable or not solvable, and they would stop there. Yeah, but that, but that claim itself is a thesis that is purportedly being given a rational justification. And that rational justification is not itself a scientific or mathematical thesis. So the very act of defending scientism presupposes a, 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 an epistemological position. That is to say, it presupposes a, 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 a knowledge standpoint that falls outside of scientism. So I think that, the, that these defenses of scientism are kind of like a shell game. They, ultimately, they always end up relocating the fallacy, but they never entirely eliminate it. Do these just map onto the standard problems of positivism? Is that what you're saying? I think that, uh, that positivism is, it's not the only instance of scientism, because you could be a, you could, either, I don't know what the word would be, a scientismist, <laughs> but you could be committed to scientism and not be a positivist, but some other kind of scientism. But I think positivism ultimately faces the same kinds of problems. It's a special case of a more general problem. OK, well, thank you for all. I'm sure that uh, there's you know, I, oh, like the last one. Uh, I have a simple question. Just what, what is the consequence of this uh, analysis? I mean, is there? A practical implication? Does it matter? Uh, does it affect the way? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's uh, <laughs> putting it in a practical term. I I don't know that. It, I mean, I you know I'd hesitate to 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 say this dogmatically, but I don't know that it has an implication. I don't I don't know that it has a scientific implication. I don't know that it has an implication that would affect research in physics, for example. Um, what I think it does have an implication for, however is how we interpret science and its results, and how we relate science to other domains of inquiry. So um, for example, does a physicist, does, does a Fermilab physicist in doing his research need to know what a law of nature is, I, in the sense of knowing which of these accounts or some other account is correct? No, I don't think so. I doubt that. On the other hand, when people talk about scientism, whether science is the only route of knowledge, whether there's such a thing as philosophy or theology or some other area, whether the humanities provide something that's genuine, you know, it's a genuinely cognitive enterprise that tells us about some feature of reality, then this issue becomes important. Because if I'm right about what I'm saying here, that would suffice to show that scientism is incorrect, that there, that there are serious questions, areas of rational discourse that science cannot answer, in which case you can't use scientism as a weapon with which to beat philosophy and the humanities and theology and these other discipline. So I think it has relevance, not for the practice of science, but for, again, how we relate science to the rest of culture. So uh, let me defer all of the questions. Uh, I, I believe you'll be at the user center uh, mm -hmm. holding for We'll try and find a lounge chair for you to sit in. <laughs> and uh, with that, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>